In the beginning, God, the love of our souls, the source of goodness, truth, and justice, a perfect kingdom of love and light. Until war broke out in heaven through one fallen angel who broke God's perfect law, Lucifer coveted God's throne and authority and deceived one third of the angels to rebel against the Holy One. Since that time, Earth is a war zone where the forces of light and darkness, good and evil, truth and deceit battle it out in a life or death conflict. Are you just a spectator or have you taken sides? Are you living the victorious life God intended for you to have? Let Marla Alona guide you through the truth of God's word that you may choose right, that you may have life and have it more abundantly, and that God's truth may bring you eternal life. Welcome to Setting the Record Straight, God's Truth for This Generation. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. In today's program, we're going to run through the chronology of end time events. Now, this is a really important study. You're going to get a lot out of this. I'm using the word chronology, as in chronology of end time events, not in the meaning of setting dates for events, because God frowns on uh, date setting, but rather in the meaning of sequencing of events. We'll be looking at the order of the unfolding of events related to Jesus' second coming. If there's any doubt in your mind that Jesus is coming soon, think again. I believe the signs are undeniable when we look at what's happening in the U.S. right now. And for those of you who may not know, the United States is the epicenter of end-time prophecy. Not Israel, not the Middle East, not Islam, the U.S. All eyes need to be watching what's happening in America right now. We have a president named Trump the trumpet that announces judgment. Barely three weeks ago, we had a rare celestial phenomenon. I'm sure you heard about this. The U.S. only, so for those of you who do not live in the U.S., it was a U.S. only solar eclipse that traversed the U.S. from coast to coast. This was a U.S. only solar eclipse. Shortly after that, Hurricane Harvey, I mean, barely 10 days or two weeks after that, Hurricane Harvey hit Texas and brought tremendous de devastation with it. Very shortly after the, the eclipse came Harvey along. And they're just barely starting to clean up all the debris and trying to restore all the vital services in Houston and other places in Texas and Louisiana. And immediately, Hurricane Irma materialized out of nowhere and is now a Category 5 hurricane crossing the Caribbean and headed for Florida. And Irma had already utterly destroyed two small Caribbean islands, St. Martin and Barbuda. And now, literally as I speak, even now, Hurricane Irma has already entered Florida with very heavy winds. The governor, of course, had declared a state of emergency and instructed everyone in the affected areas to evacuate. So hundreds of thousands of Florida residents left the state or took refuge in shelters. Now, Irma has decreased, uh, its strength has decreased from a Category 5 to a Category 2 hurricane, but it's a very large hurricane. It's big. Its footprint is huge. And the bands of this hurricane affect a large swath of land. This Hurricane Irma already destroyed two small Caribbean islands, St. Martin and Barbuda. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So, you know, this is sign upon sign. And all of this that's happening should not be a surprise to the children of light. It's been prophesied. So today we're going to delve deeply into Bible prophecy so that we won't be surprised by what's happening nor by what's coming. We want to be able to understand and correctly interpret the events that are happening all around us. And this is what we're going to study today. So first, we'll analyze some recent events that give us proof that Jesus is near, even at the door. Then, we'll quickly review the historical timeline of prophetic fulfillments so that we can situate ourselves on that prophetic timeline. That foundation will enable us to reveal the sequencing of events that have been prophesied and that will bring us to the second coming of Christ and the end of the world. The Bible says, 
But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 4 through 6. The Bible also says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. Revelation twelve twelve. So the devil knows that he has but a short time. I hope that by the end of today's study, you also will know that you have but a short time. Let's get started. Acceleration of signs in the skies over the U.S. Hurricane Irma. We already mentioned Hurricane Irma that in a very few days went from a tropical depression to a tropical storm and then a category 5 hurricane with winds of 180 to 185 miles per hour. The media, the weather analysts are calling this a monster of a storm. It is one of the largest storms ever recorded in the Atlantic. If you've watched any of the news footage, whether on television or on YouTube, you saw it's pretty scary to see nature unleashed with such violence. The winds and the, the sea. And now this hurricane um, of great magnitude is headed for Florida. It's creating fear and chaos. Families need to evacuate and to find shelter somewhere out of harm's way. The Bible tells us that in the last days there would be lots of natural disasters that would bring fear upon the people. Listen to this uh, verse of scripture. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Luke 21 verse 25. Hurricane Harvey Texas and Louisiana are still in the wake of Hurricane Harvey. There's been incredible devastation in Houston. Freeways where I used to drive all the time now look like marinas, except that instead of boats floating, it's cars. Homes, stores, schools, roads were covered, or should I say are still covered, with several feet of water. Hurricane Harvey had a couple of strange behaviors which aroused my attention, very unusual for tropical cyclones. First, it intensified in the 12 hours before it hit land. This is unique. In the past 30 years of records, no storms west of Florida have intensified in the last 12 hours before landfall. And then, of course, Harvey wouldn't leave as most hurricanes just leave. It stayed over Houston for several days, just bringing down the rain. Hurricane Harvey dumped 25 trillion gallons of water upon Texas, much of it in Houston. Now, there's a lot of speculation about Harvey as to whether it was part of a weaponized weather pattern. Uh, you know, that's using weather as a weapon is what that means to wage warfare against the citizens. Now, I wouldn't be surprised at all if that were the case, because the globalists will resort to anything to impose their agenda. For those of you who may not know, Houston is the fourth largest city of the U.S. in a state, the state of Texas, that's probably one of the healthiest American states economically. And 2017 was supposed to be a record year for farming, especially for the cotton crops, which play a very important role in the Texas economy. Now, all of these farmers are ruined and will take a few years to recover. So, regardless of whether Harvey was a deliberate fabrication or not, many weather analysts definitely do believe that global warming increased the intensity and the damage caused by Harvey. And we know, of course, that geoengineering and climate modification are conducted by governments, and it's one of the primary causes of global warming. Geoengineering is supposed to alleviate global warming, 
but in reality, it intensifies it. The solar eclipse. Barely a couple of weeks before Hurricane Harvey, you couldn't buy a pair of solar eclipse glasses anywhere in the U.S. because all the shops and distributors were sold out. Trust me, I tried. Everyone was so excited about watching this U.S.-only eclipse. There are a couple of things related to this eclipse that I think are significant. First, let's look back at three other eclipses that crossed the U.S., or at least uh, a, a portion of the U.S., and that mark some significant event in our history. The first two eclipses visible in America after the Declaration of Independence happened in 1777 and 1778. They're known as Washington's eclipses because they're both associated with key military victories of General Washington's armies. That was an extremely difficult year for the U.S. Revolution. The U.S. freedom fighters had to spend the winter in Valley Forge, also known as Valley Creek, in very adverse weather conditions. They were lacking everything from food to medicines to clothes. Now, after those two early eclipses of 1777 and 1778, there were other eclipses, but the one really worth mentioning happened in the U.S. on June 8, 1918. This solar eclipse traversed the continent from coast to coast, just like the 2017 eclipse, from Washington State to Florida. This path is roughly similar to the August 21 a total solar eclipse that we just had and was the last time that totality crossed the nation from the Pacific to the Atlantic. Now there's something very significant about the timing of this eclipse, the one in 1918. That was the year that World War I ended. It was also the year that America emerged out of World War I as a superpower. America's superpower status was subsequently confirmed during World War II, but that month of June 1918, America registered its first military victory of World War I, and that same month, America and France fought together to stop the Germans from crossing the Marne in France. Now, it's interesting to note, I think that's, this is a really interesting connection, that France's recognition of the U.S. Declaration of Independence and France's help gave the U.S. Independence War the momentum it needed to defeat the British troops. And now, fast forward to 2017, a U.S.-only solar eclipse that also traverses the continent. What is this telling us? Remember that in the account of creation, the Bible says, in Genesis 1.14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So God made the sun and the moon and the stars also for signs. So what is God trying to tell us with this eclipse? I believe the message of the 2017 solar eclipse has similar associations to these other eclipses I've mentioned, which happen at key moments of U.S. history. So first, I believe that the 2017 eclipse is linked to the principles of freedom that our nation was founded on. And secondly, I think it's linked to America's status as a superpower and America's ability to influence the rest of the world for better or for worse. Now let's ask ourselves what very important thing is happening in the U.S. right now that's related to the principles of freedom that this nation was established on. Well, there actually are several, but let's focus on Donald Trump's attempt to repeal or revoke the Johnson Amendment. This is probably, prophetically, this is the key issue related to our freedom that's on the table right now. You're listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's Truth for This Generation. The Johnson Amendment. 
So what is the Johnson Amendment? You probably never heard of it before, and I, I hadn't heard of it either until all the controversy was stirred up. So it's known as the Johnson Amendment, and it's a legislation that states that tax-exempt organizations, and that of course includes religious organizations in America, are absolutely prohibited from directly or indirectly participating in or intervening in any political campaign on behalf of or in opposition to any candidate for elective public office. So that's what the Johnson Amendment legislates. Now by repealing this law, what would happen is that religious organizations can decide to sponsor the parties and the candidates of their choice and therefore would have a much much more active voice in driving government policy and decision making. Listen to what Trump says about the Johnson Amendment. I will get rid of and totally destroy the Johnson Amendment and allow our representatives of faith to speak freely and without fear of retribution. Now listen to this statement from the president of the National Religious Broadcasters. For too long, the infamous Johnson Amendment has dangled like a sword above the heads of pastors and ministry leaders, chilling their constitutional free speech rights. Of course, Trump and the religious leaders mean well. And you also may be thinking right now, hey, I think it's great that large churches will be able to influence and get elected the candidate of their choice who's friendly to the church's agenda and is friendly to a Christian agenda. What's not to like about that? Well, this whole issue is a little bit counterintuitive. On the surface, it seems like a good thing, but there's actually a big problem. Repealing this law would significantly weaken the separation of church and state. That's a pillar of the U.S. government. And there are groups that are protesting against Trump's attempt to repeal this law, and there are groups that are currently protesting against Trump's uh, move to repeal this law because they understand that this threatens and would undermine the separation of church and state. This country was founded on the separation of church and state by people who were fleeing religious persecution in Europe. And this separation of church and state is completely in harmony with Jesus' words when he said, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. That's Matthew twenty two twenty one. And Jesus also said, My kingdom is not of this world. Uh, John eighteen thirty six. Total religious freedom can only exist in a country where government is independent of religion and where government can't be influenced by religion. History has shown us that whenever the church meddles with the state, it inevitably triggers persecution. And prophecy in particular tells us that in the United States of the last days, there will be a union of church and state, and that will result in the imposition of the mark of the beast. So we're treading on very slippery ground here. We learn that the mark of the beast is enforced Sunday worship. And the image of the beast is the union of church and state, as it was during the heyday of the papacy during the Middle Ages, for example. So listen to this quote from the book The Great Controversy by Ellen White, page 443. But what is the image to the beast, and how is it to be formed? The image is made by the two-horned beast, that's the lamb beast, that's the U.S., and is an image to the beast. It is also called an image of the beast. Then to learn what the image is like and how it is to be formed, we must study the characteristics of the beast itself, the papacy. When the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit and power of God. And in order to control the consciences of the people, she sought the support of the secular power. 
The result was the papacy, a church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to further her own ends, especially, especially for the punishment of heresy. In order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. This would be the outcome of the abolishment of the Johnson Amendment. The religious power having enough control of the civil government that the authority of the state will be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. Now again, this may sound like a good thing, but the church should woo people into uh, doing good, into coming closer to Christ. Those things cannot be enforced. God respects above all things our freedom of choice. He does not want forced worship. He does not want religion to be imposed on anyone. He wants us to come to him because we respond to his call freely of our own free will and because we love him. So this idea that the authority of the state will be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends is not as far-fetched as it sounds. That erosion, the erosion of civil liberties that we're seeing in America today would have been unimaginable even 20 years ago. So what does this have to do with the second coming of Jesus? Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 The Antichrist, also known as the beast, will be reinstated. The deadly wound will be healed. The papacy will again be given power to overcome God's people worldwide. This will be a worldwide power. Revelation 13, verse 7. And sadly, the U.S., a world superpower, will be the one to heal the wound. And by its influence, the U.S. will lead the world to worship the beast. It's Revelation 13, verse 12. Where are we in the prophetic timeline? Let's consider now some big picture milestones or time indicators that can help us situate where we are right now in the timeline of Bible prophecy. There are many prophetic markers, time markers in the Bible, and today we'll consider four of them. And you'll see for yourself that this stacks up to tell us we're almost out of time. Number one, we're living in the period after the end of prophetic time. We studied this in our last program when the angel of Revelation 10, the angel that stands on the sea and the land holding the little book, remember, took an oath. Let's read. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servants the prophets. Now how to make a combination there of King James and New King James. So it says, let me read this again. This is, this is very important. First it says, the angel says, after swearing an oath uh, to the Creator, that there should be time no longer. Certain versions say delay. It should say that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, some versions say when he begins to sound, but no, that's not the right translation. When he is about to sound, he is poised to sound, he hasn't sounded yet. The mystery of God will be finished, as he declared to his servants, the prophets. This is Revelation 10, verses 5 through 7, where it says, Time shall be no longer. It means that after 1844, 
there are no more prophecies given with a date. Hence, we're living after the end of prophetic time. Not the end of time, but the end of prophetic time. So there are no more dates at this point. Number two, we're living in the time of the toes of the statue of Daniel chapter 2. This is the time of the divided Roman Empire. This is the statue that appeared to King Nebuchadnezzar in a dream. And this dream foretold the successive unfolding of earthly kingdoms. This is a revelation that the Lord gave uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And these earthly kingdoms would succeed each other until God's kingdom would be established. The legs of the statue were made of iron and represented the Roman Empire. The feet and the toes of the statue were made of iron mingled with potter's clay, and they represented the divided Roman Empire. So the ten toes are the ten nations of the divided Roman Empire. Let's read from Daniel 2, verses 43 and 44. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. We can see this in the European Union. No matter how hard they try, they can't get it together. Let's continue. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. We see throughout history and we see in current events that although the European nations try to come together, they can't cleave to one another. The diversity of languages and culture makes it very difficult for them. Plus, they have a history of war. They're all constantly fighting against each other, or they have been at least in the past. So even though they tried to unite their economies through the European Union, Brexit recently marked the beginning of the end of the EU. Number three. We're witnessing the healing of the deadly wound of the Antichrist power. 1798 marked the end of the 1260-year prophecy, also called the time and times and the dividing of time, or the time and times and half a time. Uh, this prophecy is given in Daniel 7.25, Daniel 12.7, and Revelation 12.14. So clearly, a very important prophecy because the Bible gives us three witnesses for this prophecy. The beast, meaning the Antichrist power, again, which is the papacy, had been given dominion over God's people for 1260 years. What did it do during those 1260 years? It trampled upon the sanctuary in heaven. It tried to obliterate Jesus' role as intercessor and high priest by introducing all kinds of counterfeit intercessors such as saints, angels, the Virgin Mary, the priests, and the Pope. This is what's referred to in Daniel 8 verse 13. How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? Question. So the 1260 years correspond to the period called the Dark Ages in Europe, where people lived in spiritual darkness. They had no choice but to obey the Pope and the very corrupt clergy. The Pope and the clergy occupied positions of power in each nation-state. The papacy, again, also known as the beast or the Antichrist power, received the deadly wound that was prophesied in Revelation 13.3 and Revelation 13.12. This happened in 1798. The French army under one of Napoleon Bonaparte's generals, that was uh, General Berthier, invaded Rome, deposed the Pope, and took him prisoner to France. But that same chapter of the book of Revelation tells us that the beast's deadly wound will be healed. In other words, the papacy will regain the same level of world power that it had before 1798, uh, in the period when it ruled over Europe. The Bible says, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, 
and all the world wondered after the beast. Revelation 13, verse 3. You're listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's Truth for This Generation. The Protestant reformers all agreed and understood that the papacy was the beast and was the Antichrist power. Sadly, today, our Protestant denominations have forgotten what the fathers of our faith knew so well. This is why it's so important to study history, to understand how prophecy is fulfilled. That's why we're taking the time to go back to some of the prophecies that have already been fulfilled, and we're, we're reviewing them historically so that we have that solid grounding, so that we can have that confidence of the sure word of prophecy that what God... Um, the word of God shall come to pass. It shall be established. He spoke it. It will happen. In the fullness of time, it will happen. So that's why it's very important to look back to history and remember what has happened so that we take that, that learning with us as we, as we look forward. What, what's happening today is that we observe the position of prestige and power that the Pope has and we know that we're very close to the complete healing of that wound. And indeed, very soon the whole world will wander after the beast. Number four. We're living in the time between the desecrations of the two institutions that God established at creation. At creation, God instituted marriage and the Sabbath. I have another study called Prophecy Update, Crime Against Humanity and Nature. And I demonstrate in that study how Satan set out to destroy every single element of the Lord's creation. And the only one still standing is the Sabbath. So on day six of creation, God gave us the first institution, that was marriage. And then on day seven of creation, the Sabbath was instituted. Now here in America, marriage was desecrated in June of 2015 by the legalizing of gay marriage across the U.S. by the U.S. Supreme Court. And I just want to mention here that I, you know, when I think about the LGBT movement taking the symbol of the rainbow as their banner, it breaks my heart because that is such a beautiful symbol of God's covenant. And of course, Satan had to take that. And in fact, the angel of Revelation 10, when the angel of Revelation 10 comes down with the little book in his hand, he is wearing on his head a rainbow, the sign of the covenant. And it just breaks my heart how Satan has taken that symbol that beautiful symbol that God gave mankind and has desecrated it by making it um, a symbol of the LGBT movement. Anyway, I'm persuaded that the Sunday law will follow shortly after same-sex marriage. I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. These are twin institutions. One, they follow each other by a day. So if the... Um, institution of uh, marriage was desecrated and that was created on day six then the sabbath being created on day seven uh, trust me that's going to come very quickly the desecration of the sabbath the what's called the abomination of desolation also will happen very soon the workings of the papacy behind the scenes using the protestant denominations most of them and this will result in the imposition of a Sunday law. So the abomination of desolation is the desecration of the Sabbath by the enforcement of a Sunday law, or by the, by the uh, establishment, rather, of a Sunday law. The Sunday law, what it does is that it establishes the first day of the week as a holy day of worship instead of the Sabbath day that God requires. And we, we've been observing the Pope in his feverish efforts to unite the Protestant churches under his wing. And that whole unity, um, unity movement, if you will, is going to very quickly bring us to that outcome of that Sunday law. 
The Catholic papacy is not ashamed to say that Sunday observance is the mark of her ecclesiastical authority. I'm quoting, I'm quoting C.F. Thomas, Chancellor of Cardinal Gibbons. Uh, this is a quote from a letter dated November 11, 1895. So they're not embarrassed to say that Sunday is the mark of the churches, the Catholic Church's ecclesiastical authority. When the Sunday law is passed in the U.S., it will set the trend for the rest of the world. At that point, listen closely, at that point, when the Sunday law is passed, America will have filled the cup of her iniquity and severe judgments will follow. Chronology of End Time Events Okay, we're going to review now the chronology of end time events that are prophesied. Okay, again, we're not setting dates. We're just looking at things in their successive unfolding. So some events are fulfilled. We're, we're going to start with those. But as we go down the timeline, many are not yet fulfilled. There's a previous study called The Mark of the Beast that will give you some very useful background so that you can better follow along today. Let's go step by step. We're going to start with 1776. 1776. America declared her independence from Great Britain and in 1789 established the Constitution of the United States. In Bible prophecy, America is the beast that rises up from the earth, having two horns like a lamb. The lamb is Jesus. This means that when America was born, it was a Christian nation. Yet the Bible tells us that this country will speak like a dragon. And who's the dragon? The dragon is Satan working through Rome to accomplish his ends. 1798. End of the 1260 day prophecy. The Antichrist power receives the deadly wound in 1798. The historic event was the invasion of the Vatican by, uh, as we said earlier, General Berthier and the overthrow of the papal power by the French. The Antichrist is not a person, but a power. It's a system. Not any single pope, but the Roman Catholic papacy as a whole. It's a role, not a person. So whoever pope happens to be fulfilling the role of the head of the Vatican and the head of the Holy See, that is that person would be called the Antichrist, but all popes, in reality, are the Antichrist. 1844. End of the 2300-day prophecy. This year marked the blowing of the trumpet to announce the beginning of the investigative judgment. We have discussed this at great length. This year, 1844, marked the beginning of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary which is the judgment of all those who claimed or who claim today to walk with God. The judgment proceeds chronologically, starting with Adam downwards, and it starts with the dead. At some point, and we'll come back to this because this is very key, at some point, the judgment will transition from the cases of the dead to the cases of the living who profess to be Christ's. 1844 corresponds to the first angel's message of Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Let's read it. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. So this message is about worshiping the creator. And it's also telling us that judgment has started in heaven. 1860. Creation of the Advent Movement. This was a cross-denominational mobilization of people who loved Christ and who were waiting for him to come back. So after the great awakening of the 1830s and the 1840s, and then the great disappointment of 1844, 
those who remained faithful and continued to dig for gems of biblical truth, they came together to found the Advent Movement, and that eventually gave birth to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 1922. Mussolini restores the Vatican and reinstates the Pope as head of the nation-state in exchange for the Pope's support of his government. So the Pope is both a political ruler and a religious ruler. He combines church and state in his one person, in his own person. 1929. Mussolini and the Pope signed the Lateran Treaty. In this treaty, the papacy recognized the state of Italy with Rome as its capital, and Italy in return recognized papal sovereignty over Vatican City or the Holy See and guaranteed full independence for the Pope. So this marks the beginning of the healing of the wound. As you know, healing is a process. It doesn't happen overnight, and it's still taking place. We're on the verge of the complete healing of that wound. Now, from the 1950s up to 2017, the Catholic Church is rocked by continuous reports of sexual abuse of young boys. The scandals emerged from all across Europe and beyond. Austria, Germany, the Netherlands, Spain, Switzerland, Brazil, and more recently Australia. So this begins to fulfill the second angel's message. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Revelation 14, verse 8. What's interesting about the second angel's message is that we usually take the fornication to mean spiritual adultery. The fact that the church is unfaithful to God by seeking worldly power and by becoming entangled with the kings of the world. And that is absolutely true. That's what that usually means. But there's also a very literal sense in which she made the nations drink of the wine of her fornication with young children. In another study called Prophecy Update, Judgment is Coming, I discuss the spiritual roots of pedophilia. And uh, it's quite interesting. So Babylon is fallen, is fallen, because it's a process in which she continues to fall lower and lower. In fact, she falls so low that when the loud cry is given, we'll get to that loud cry in just a moment, the angel that gives the loud cry says, Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Revelation 18, verse 2. 1982. Beginning of the alliance between Pope Jean-Paul II and U.S. President Ronald Reagan during the Cold War. This alliance probably helped catalyze the coming down of the Berlin Wall in 1986 and the defeat of communism. 2013. Pope Francis is elected to lead the Catholic Church in replacement of Pope Benedict, who resigned in February of 2013. We vividly remember the images of lightning falling from heaven upon the Dome of the Vatican that evening of Pope Benedict's re resignation. That was quite a sight. And since then, Pope Francis has enjoyed great popularity, world-renowned. He's the darling of the media. And he, and we'll see in a moment, that he is becoming the darling of many political bodies as well. 2014. President Obama secretly called on Pope Francis to help negotiate the Cuban situation in Guantanamo. That same year, the Pope reached out to a large gathering of evangelicals. We've all seen the video. That was a group of evangelicals that was brought together by Kenneth Copeland. And this video uh, of the Pope, uh, sort of a selfie video uh, using his iPhone, 
Uh, this initiated a series of visits to the Vatican by American Protestant leaders that included Joel Osteen and Rick Warren. You're listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's Truth for This Generation. 2015. In a historic event, Pope Francis was invited to speak before the U.S. Congress, followed by a speech before the United Nations in New York. In both political forums, the Pope received a standing ovation. So I hope that with that you can see the progression here in the healing of the deadly wound. We're only a breath away from the total healing of the wound and from the papacy receiving once more power to rule over the entire world. Okay, so far we've covered events that have been fulfilled. Let's turn our attention now to the sequence of events that are prophesied, but not yet fulfilled. Once the papacy's wound is completely healed, its political power will be fully restored. Let's read in Revelation 13, verse 7. And it was given unto him, referring to the beast or the Antichrist, to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So this was a global power that was given him. And Rome, Rome is a persecuting power. So the persecution will be global. Rome hasn't changed, especially now with the Jesuits openly in charge. Rome will exercise great power over the kings of the earth, starting with the president of the U.S., working through an alliance with the Protestant churches. And the Protestant churches in the book of Revelation are referred to as the harlot daughters of the mother harlot. This is in Revelation 17, verse 5. So the mother church, the mother harlot, has harlot daughters that follow after her. The thought that Rome will exercise great power over the kings of the earth, starting with the president of the U.S., um, is not so far-fetched, especially since, as we discussed earlier, the Johnson Amendment could very easily open that door to uh, the churches having a lot of influence in the U.S. government. American Protestants will reach out to the Pope and put pressure on the American government to help establish the Pope's agenda. This is the evil trilogy working together, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The dragon, we said, is Satan working through Rome. The beast is the Antichrist or the papacy. And the false prophet is U.S. Protestantism that is influencing and working through the U.S. government. What is the Pope's agenda? The Pope is using poverty, immigrants, and refugees, climate change as wedges to ultimately push a Sunday law. Now, what's interesting about the Pope's agenda is that it's not a spiritual agenda. These are not spiritual issues. Poverty, immigration, climate change, refugees. These are political issues. This is a political agenda. Now, I anticipate that in a country that has become as secular and as anti-Christian as the U.S. has become, something pretty big will have to happen to justify the passing of a Sunday law. Now, we know that the Pope justifies the Sunday law by claiming that it's going to help climate change, give the earth a break once uh, one day a week. But there's going to have to be a major economic crisis or a succession of natural disasters or civil unrest, as we've seen in certain cities, or a combination of all of the above in order to justify the passing of a Sunday law. Now, what's going to happen is that events will stir up the masses to cry out for Sunday to be made holy and uh, supposedly to appease what is perceived as God's wrath and his judgment. So, uh, presumably, natural disasters are going to be a big part of this. So, the Sunday law will be passed in the U.S. and subsequently in the other major countries of the world. The passing of the Sunday law unleashes persecution against God's commandment-keeping people who will refuse 
to keep a counterfeit day of worship. So Sabbath keepers are going to be under attack. The issue will be brought before mankind in very clear terms. Follow the Bible. Thus saith the Lord, keep the seventh day, which is the Sabbath of the Lord. Or follow church tradition, keep Sunday, make the Pope happy, and uh, make the Protestant um, church leaders happy in defiance of the law of God. The Sabbath issue is going to be black and white. God's people proclaim the third angel's message. Let's read that. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This third angel's message is the worst curse in the Bible, the worst curse ever pronounced upon human beings is the curse upon those who take the mark of the beast. The Sunday law now is escalating through a gradual progression. So first, people are not allowed to do any work on Sunday. Then, they're forced to worship on Sunday. And finally, they're forbidden to worship on the Sabbath. The United States chooses to legislate against the First Amendment of the Constitution, or in spite of the First Amendment of the Constitution, that says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So first, the U.S. passes a law that establishes religion by imposing Sunday worship, and second, the U.S. prohibits the free exercise of religion by forbidding Sabbath worship. Now listen very closely to this. This is extremely important. At some point in this process of the Sunday law being passed and the giving of the loud cry, the judgment in heaven passes from the dead to the living. All are faced with a great obedience test, taking the seal of God or taking the mark of the beast. So the great obedience test is between the Sabbath, which is the seal of God, or enforced Sunday worship, which is the mark of the beast. God then sends down his Holy Spirit upon his commandment-keeping people. The latter rain empowers them to carry the third angel's message with great power. Now remember that the latter rain is much more abundant than the early rain. So God's Sabbath keepers on the earth receive power from above to work miracles and signs and wonders, to work healings and deliverances for the glory of God. Hallelujah. I'm so excited. I can't wait for that. I'm telling you. I pray for that latter rain every day. Now with Holy Spirit power, the third angel's message swells up into what we call the loud cry. It grows, it increases, it is amplified, it's magnified. And what is the loud cry? The loud cry is the third angel's message which is repeated and enlarged. Let's read. After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen is fallen and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her 
and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Revelation 18, verses 1 through 5. At this point, people receive the message, not so much with intellectual arguments or even biblical arguments, but rather with the convicting power of God's Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. In the meantime, as all of this is going on, the adulterous union of church and state is tightening its grip on the true people of God. No one can buy or sell except by taking the mark of the beast. So no one can go to Walmart. If you, you, know, you can't go to Walmart. If you're keeping the Sabbath or if you refuse to take the mark of the beast and you refuse to worship on Sunday, well, you won't be able to shop at Walmart or Targets or Whole Foods. Um, it's going to get very, very difficult for God's people. Then a death decree is issued against those who persist, that small minority who persist in keeping the Sabbath. Let's read Revelation 13, 15 through 17. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. Now this is talking about the beast that rose from the land, from the earth. This is the land beast with the two horns, the lamb horns. This is referring to the beast that rose from the earth that had two horns like a lamb. This is the United States. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. It's very interesting, just a quick side note here, that Jesus' first coming was marked by a death decree. Remember when Herod commanded that all the male children two years and under be killed, and then Joseph and Mary had to flee to Egypt? Well, in the same way, when the death decree is issued against God's people, they have to flee to the mountains and the deserted places to escape from certain death. Many will be imprisoned, probably tortured. Millions will die who have been justified and witnessed for Jesus. God delays the second coming of Jesus and the destruction of the world to give his people time. Let's read from Acts 3, 19 and 20. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before. Many of God's people will heed the cry to come out of the Babylonian churches, whether the Catholic Church or the Protestant churches, Multitudes depart from Babylon as she falls. Ellen White says this in Great Controversy, page 327, Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. So it is going to be a great multitude, hallelujah, that gets saved. You're listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's Truth for This Generation. Many antichrists reveal themselves throughout this whole process. And then the nearly overmastering delusion. We're put on guard about this. So listen closely. Satan himself will impersonate Christ. Satan will disguise himself as an angel of light and will impersonate Christ. And only those who have been faithful students of Scripture will know the exact manner of Jesus' second coming, which is described in the Bible. And Satan will not be allowed to counterfeit how Jesus comes, the manner of Jesus' second coming, because that is the sign to Jesus' true people. So this is why Jesus warned his followers 
then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. God's true people are not deceived because they don't trust their senses. They only trust the word of God. But everyone else is deceived. And now finally, after much delay, after what seems like an interminable delay, Michael the archangel stands up. This is Daniel 12 verse 1. Michael the Archangel is another name for Jesus. When Michael stands up, game is over. Probation closes. This is the close of grace. The heavenly sanctuary is closed. There is no more intercession for sin. Jesus symbolically places the sins of his people on Satan's head, and Satan will have to pay for his share of their sins. Those who are saved remain saved. Those who are lost remain lost. Let's read in Revelation 22, 11, the solemn words of Jesus. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. When Michael stands up in heaven, that's the signal to the seven angels of the seven plagues that they can unleash the plagues upon the earth. At this point, the Holy Spirit is withdrawn from the earth, and the wicked men are given totally over to Satan's control. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Again, that's Daniel 12, verse 1. Satan is now completely unrestrained because the Holy Spirit has been the restrainer. And now Satan goes forth to destroy the earth and to destroy the people with war, natural calamities, and all manner of chaos and destruction. The seven angels having the seven vials of the wrath of God come out of the heavenly sanctuary. This is described in Revelation 15. The plagues start to fall upon the wicked of the earth. God's people, whose names were confirmed in the Lamb's Book of Life, are preserved, they're protected, they don't receive the plagues. After these things I looked, and behold... The temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls, full of the wrath of God, who lives for ever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God, and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Revelation 15, 5 through 8. The plagues start to fall upon the wicked. They're convinced that it's because of the refusal of God's faithful people to worship on Sunday. The persecution then becomes fierce and brutal. Remember that the Jesuits are masters of torture and persecution. God's people have no rest. They're driven up the mountains and into the wilderness. Angels minister to them to keep them alive. Their bread and water are sure. Nevertheless, death is very near. God's people need extraordinary patience and faith to make it through this time of trouble. This time is referred to as Jacob's trouble because God's saints will have to wrestle with God many days until their final deliverance. 
And this is why the book of Revelation says, Here is the patience of the saints. Jesus comes back to the earth to deliver his people. He's seen in the clouds of angels. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Matthew 24, verse 27 and 30th through 31st. The faithful dead are resurrected and rise in the air to meet their Savior. The faithful living are translated into glorious bodies and follow them. The wicked are utterly destroyed and the earth goes back into primordial chaos, almost to the state it was in before creation. Satan is bound to the earth for a thousand years to contemplate the fruits of his rebellion. He has no one to tempt and will have plenty of time to meditate upon what awaits him. God's people travel back to heaven with Jesus for a week to celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is the Feast of Tabernacles that we're so looking forward to. Immediately after this, the millennial period begins. The millennium takes place in heaven, not on earth, and during a thousand years, God's saints will be performing a work of judgment on the wicked. To God's faithful people, it will seem that their Creator has forgotten them. We will be persecuted, scorned, humiliated, abused, and unjustly accused of all the tragedy going on on the earth all around us. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We need to stand firm. God will anoint us with the latter rain to give us power to stand. We must have the faith of Daniel in the lion's den and the faith of the three Hebrew young men in the fiery furnace. God will deliver us, but we need to get ready and ensure that we have oil in our lamps. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Watch ye therefore and pray always, that ye may be found worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Thank you for listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's truth for this generation. If you've been blessed by this program, we encourage you to share it with others. To ask any question related to this Bible study or any other spiritual matter, email us at info at citybiblegroup.com. To find out more, visit our website at citybiblegroup.com. Hi, I'm Marla Ilana. Thank you so much for studying God's Word with me. Please click on the subscribe button below and you'll be blessed with many more powerful truths for our generation. Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready?